I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, our second keynote speaker for the for the conference, um, Ashish Goel. Um, Ashish is professor of management science and engineering at Stanford. Uh, he has been on the faculty at USC and Stanford. Um, he's uh, very well known uh, in in this community, and 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 in other community. He's, he's a very um, he, he works works on uh, very broad research, working in many, many different areas. Um, he his work uh, spans you know social networks, online auctions, methods in big data, and uh, crowdsource democracy, which is what he's going to talk about um, today. And um, uh, he has received the uh, Sloan Faculty Fellowship. He wrote a paper that's particularly um, well known in this community. Um, uh, truthful auctions for pri pricing search keywords, which won the SIG Econ uh, Test of Time Award, um, and uh, has the the answer to the questions that my students always ask when I teach them gener generally second price auctions. So I encourage you to look at that paper if you haven't seen it. Um, and uh, and Ashish was also uh, an advisor for Twitter from 2009 to 2014. Um, so he has, has a lot of in industry insight. Um, so um, that, uh, that's it for, for me. Uh, Ashish, if you're ready, please take it away. Uh, uh, thanks a lot uh, for the invitation uh, to the program committee and thanks to the audience. Uh, uh, this, uh, this project has been somewhat difficult. Uh, I'll explain why. So it's uh, a particular pleasure to be invited here is joint work uh, with uh, with many of my current and past students, uh, and then also uh, people in Jim Fishkin's group and also people in Kamesh Munagla's group. So the motivation uh, for this broad field uh, and, and the title of the talk is Open Problems in Deliberation and Participatory Democracy. And so I'm gonna focus mostly on problems. These are not going to be very crisp problems. And uh, I'm not going to be able to define them in complete, uh, with complete formality, but please do catch hold of me by email uh, or uh, just after the talk uh, or in any other, uh, using any other mechanism and happy to sort of explain more. And uh, I'm going to mostly not define my models very carefully, except for one problem where I'm going to get into some detail. <laughs> So the motivation is that the internet has not proved to be a fruitful place for uh, deliberation. So anytime you go to a website and you try to have a serious conversation, it's going to inevitably devolve into chaos. So people are going to start calling each other names. Uh, nothing productive is going to come out. Right? And algorithms and mechanism design have not played a substantively important role in addressing this issue. Uh, you don't see any evidence of sort of algorithms having improved uh, the conversation on Facebook or the New York Times comment pages or Wall Street Journal. And I think one of the difficulties is that there's no real middle layer in this uh, area between ideas and deployments, especially in the civic process space. So for example, uh, if you want to influence how ad auctions get done, you would write a paper in EC and then you would reach out to people at Google or Facebook and they would ask us to to come and do an internship and hopefully your ideas, if they're good, they'll gradually find, find their way into practice. Yeah. This middle layer, right, of uh, companies like Google or Facebook or Uber or uh, Apple is missing from the civic space, so middle layer of technically savvy companies. So if any ideas of how to improve uh, uh, a civic process then uh, using technology, you have to essentially do everything yourself, come up with ideas, build a prototype, build a system, deploy it, and then go and evangelize it, which makes for uh, long, uh, uh, for want of a better word, long sales cycles. And uh, that's the difficulty that I was alluding to when I, when I mentioned at the beginning that it's been a somewhat difficult, uh, long and difficult project. And then also there's a lack of sophisticated models for opinion change, polarization and deliberation. They are sort of mathematically precise, sufficiently precise that you can use them to prove theorems, sufficiently tractable and also at the same time empirically validated. Right? So I think these have been the two major difficulties uh, in this project. And uh, hopefully, uh, but, but hopefully the field is now at a place where there are at least some well-defined open problems that people can start to work on. 
So as an outline, I'm going to first give you an example of complex voting, such as participatory budgeting. So generally, social choice uh, in general and computational social choice in particular, often not exclusively, but mostly focuses on uh, simple voting methods or simple votes. For example, you're electing a representative. Uh, you're trying to find, form a committee. And so the, the big challenge is uh, on the deliberative side and participatory side is when you're trying to make complex decisions. So I'll give participatory budgeting as a, as a, as a quick example. So I'm going to talk about equitable participation in civic processes. I'm going to describe sequential deliberation and the automated moderator. And the fourth thing is just there. I don't think I'll actually get to it. So, so this is so participatory budgeting is a process emphasizing the role of citizen involvement in political decision making. What typically happens in participatory budgeting is that uh, some amount of money gets put to the vote directly by the public. And the government, the, the council or the municipality or the mayor or the governor, as the case may be, they commit to using that money in exactly the form that's dictated by the, uh, by the residents of that community. So it's uh, catching on in uh, North America. I think uh, maybe like uh, several dozen cities now do it. <laughs> And we have a platform for doing it. Our platform is open source and free. Uh, we are always looking for collaborations to use uh, the platform. It's been used in over 100 elections. It's got language support, has uh, many voting methods, has some customized uh, UI elements. We can do many kinds of authentications, visualizations, analytics. And so I think what I'm going to do next is maybe give you a quick uh, demo of the platform. In particular, I'm going to give you a quick demo of uh, one of the exam one of the features of the platform, one of the voting methods on the platform, and that voting mechanism is what we call knapsack voting. It's also been called shopping cart voting elsewhere in the community. And so, what happens uh, in this voting method is that uh, basically there's a cost bar at the top, and uh, you can keep selecting projects okay, as long as you still have. Uh, money left in your knapsack. Yeah. And so right now there's not enough money for composting education and community farmers markets. And so you can't choose that. Uh, there's enough money for uh, youth training programs. I could choose that. If I want to select uh, composting education, I have to go and remove something else. And now I have enough money for composting. Yeah. And so this makes it makes a little bit of a game. Uh, and uh, the reason this is called knapsack voting is because uh, as you can imagine, uh, this is like you're trying to fill a knapsack, which is the amount of money you have available. Each voter is trying to do it. And uh, they have some internal notion of value and they're just trying to maximize their value by packing as many of these uh, projects into this knapsack, this green bar representing the knapsack as they can. Right? So for example, if you have a million dollars, it's as if you have a knapsack of capacity, a million you have a bunch of these projects and you want to pack as much as many of these projects as possible, not as many, but as much value as possible. Um, and of course, there's no societally accepted uh, notion of this value. Okay? And if you ask individuals, they have a very hard time even articulating what the value of each project is for them. But at least in our experiments, people are able to reasonably well solve the knapsack problem to their satisfaction. Okay. So empirically and theoretically, uh, knapsack voting leads to a final solution that maximizes agreement with the voting population. We're going to assume fractional projects uh, on this slide, which means that projects can be done partially. Okay. It's incentive compatible, assuming voter utility has a very specific form, which is which means that the voter cost is the L1 cost. And what that means is, uh, uh, what L1 cost means is that uh, every voter has an ideal budget in mind. And the cost of any other budget is just the L1 distance between their ideal budget and another budget. Okay. Also, uh, Freeman et al. Uh, made a very nice, gave a very nice framework where they showed that up to tie breaking, knapsack voting, or something very much like it, is one extreme in a class of mechanisms called moving fenting mechanisms. And is the only known mechanism in that class that's Pareto optimal. Uh, alternates uh, to knapsack voting have been studied, uh, and uh, one of the most interesting results is in unknown linear utility settings. But instead of assuming the L1 cost, you assume the tradi more traditional uh, additive linear utilities. Okay. 
And there's a very nice, and that work is by Bernardi et al. And uh, there's a very nice survey by Aziz and Shah on uh, participatory budgeting from last year. Yeah. Uh, but to summarize, partners and voters like knapsack voting, and voters can generally solve the underlying knapsack problem efficiently. But we still are left with uh, several open problems here. Yeah. So on the theory side, one interesting problem is to compute the core of the participatory budgeting problem with linear utilities. Yeah. And so what's the core? The core is basically a, uh, a budget. Okay? So if you adopt that budget, okay, and what's a, so a budget is basically the amount of money you're allocating to each individual project. The core is basically a budget such that with that budget, there's no subpopulation which will be happier by splitting off with their share of the money and forming their own separate budget. Okay? is uh, very much aligned to the notion of core in uh, standard allocation problems. <laughs> then, as I, in terms of theory and modeling, the following direction is fairly interesting. And I'll give you an example uh, of where uh, things like this come up. And that's uh, menu-driven participatory budgeting and also interacting projects. So often, uh, the way I've given the, the way I've shown you the interface before, these projects all played the same kind of role. You could choose one, you could choose the other, you could choose whichever ones you want, as long as you don't exceed uh, uh, the, the capacity, right? Or the amount of money you have. Uh, by the way, I can't uh, see the chat, okay. Uh, I, I, did see the, I did see the chat now, thank you. I, I, I will uh, answer that question that came up. Uh, what do this is decide which projects are funded as a function of the votes? Okay. Or at least I'll explain it with a picture. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in fact, uh, let me do that now. Okay. So, so what you essentially do is uh, uh, for uh, what you essentially do is basically very similar to approval voting. Uh, and uh, for projects which are not continuous projects, uh, it turns out to be very much like approval voting. You just uh, choose the projects which get the most votes, okay? and you choose them in order. So you first choose the library bus shelter because it has 334 votes, then uh, uh, supplementation because it's three, sorry, supplementation was 345, then bus shelter then is 334, and then you keep doing it. And of course, as you'll see, the last project will get chosen fractionally. Uh, the difference between this aggregation method and what Freeman et al. has suggested is just in what happens in this rounding. And uh, when projects are not fractional, then you essentially treat, uh, it, it, you, you treat each project as a collection of a single dollar project. So the first dollar for a project, second dollar for a project, third dollar for a project. And then you essentially run the same uh, aggregation method, but this time on uh, single dollar projects. So, so for example, what that means is if someone votes for say uh, $2,250, okay? and I hope people can see what I'm highlighting on the screen. If not, please say something in chat. Okay? And I, I saw Nisak already answered this question on chat. So basically if, if somebody chooses to allocate $2,250, then what they're really doing is they're allocating $1 each for the first 2,250 sub projects for this particular project. And then you run regular approval voting where you're just allocating money to whoever has the, whichever project has the most votes. And that you can visualize it by using some sort of simple uh, uh, heat chart, some sort of simple water filling chart. And this chart is basically what we so show cities and municipalities because it's sort of more intuitive to them than uh, the underlying math. I'm going to refrain from going full screen because that just uh, introduces delay each time. Yeah. So in terms of theory and modeling, uh, one really interesting direction is uh, many driven participatory budgeting where these projects might have uh, various interactions. Uh, so for example, there might be combinatorial constraints on words and budgets. I'll give you an example soon. Then you could have uh, things which are subsidies and complements of generalizations thereof. So for example, imagine that you want, uh, you have two projects, right? Uh, one project says, uh, make a parking lot on the east side of uh, uh, the Huang building. The other one says, make a parking lot on the west side of Huang building. You're clearly not going to make two of these parking lots. So these projects are substitutes of each other. And if both these projects happen to be on the ballot, 
then somehow you have to make sure that only one of them gets done. And people have to be able to vote in a way in which they can express their preference between these two projects without having both projects competed. Okay? Complements is something where it only makes sense to do one project if you also do the other project. Okay? And uh, this is sort of where I think the, the main uh, uh, research difficulty of this problem currently lies. There's been some recent preliminary progress on computational tractability of the underlying optimization problems by Jan et al. And uh, uh, some of my students have also made some partial progress uh, in this problem. But I, I know this sounds uh, a little bit uh, vague, so let me just give you an example. So in addition to our platform, we also have a bunch of research prototypes uh, that we develop with cities on a one-off basis. And one of them is what we call uh, uh, a platform for residents to engage in the, in the budgeting process for the full city. Yeah. And so this is different from what we are, we are legal participatory budgeting. Participatory budgeting was an election where whatever residents voted for would actually happen. And this is more like a survey in the sense that uh, whatever residents uh, vote for or provide feedback on then goes to the city council and then they or the mayor and then they make their own budget. So in this particular case, uh, as you'll see, there's a sort of bunch of fairly real information. You can increase or decrease funding for the administration for development department, but then you also have additional department changes. Okay? And uh, if you get to, for example, the fire department, right? you could essentially be doing something that's money neutral. You could be removing two fire engines or removing one fire engine and you could be adding a rescue ambulance. Okay? And that's very different from someone else who wants to just remove a rescue ambulance, right? So right now, if I want to add an engine and remove an ambulance, I'm roughly adding, roughly saving $5 million, uh, $1.5 million. But if I just remove an ambulance, I'm also saving roughly $1.5 million. And so just because I'm voting to save $1.5 million, I might have a very different, uh, uh, saving $1.5 million is not the same uh, uh, in both settings, right? They're very different suggestions. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, there really is no, uh, theory, no strong theoretical uh, uh, progress has been made in designing uh, ballots of this type, ma making them strategy proof and aggregating them. Okay. And uh, there's a big need for this because uh, the, the earlier participatory budgeting elections that I showed you, they tend to be small for a million dollars or $2 million. And they tend to have a smaller engagement with the city, with, with the residents. Uh, but these uh, bigger processes of the type that say, I'm showing you that Long Beach ran, uh, they can affect the full city budget. Then I think, uh, another direction where uh, theory and modeling would be very useful is to do participatory budgeting when the set of projects is not fixed upfront. So right now, most of these participatory budgeting elections happen in two stages. In the first stage, uh, uh, we fix the set of projects and that's done by some kind of a steering committee or some kind of a citizen committee. In the second phase, uh, people vote on these projects. But every year we get some interest in understanding, can you somehow combine the two? Or can we somehow also give guidance on how to choose a set of projects which go on the ballot? It'll be very interesting to understand uh, what that voting method would look like or what that aggregation method would look like where if as the vote is happening, people can sort of come in and enter their uh, pet projects. Okay. And the next question is something which is uh, sort of goes at the heart of many of, many of the processes of this type. And that's do residents of a city make good decisions? Okay. So there's been a lot of work, uh, including some by Prakashia and his students, uh, to show that residents of a city make consistent decisions and that uh, our aggregation methods do a good job of aggregating it. Yeah. So we have done a couple of processes where you aggregate things two different ways and they turn out to be more or less the same. Uh, so, so we know we are doing a good job of aggregating uh, what the residents of a city want, but are are those residents making good decisions, good long-term decisions? And there hasn't really been much study of, uh, say, going back after five years, or going back after 10 years, and asking people, do you think you made a good decision? Was this the right thing to do? So that was the first direction. It had to do with uh, participatory budgeting. And this, the goal was to show sort of a somewhat more complex uh, uh, example of voting. The next thing, is to, next thing is about equitable participation. 
and there sort of the most the hardest question for me uh, one of the hardest questions is normative which is is it important for a civic process say participatory budgeting to have equitable participation among demographic groups for example have a random set of residents participate and how do you correct a, for a bias sample and should you, if you happen to get a bias sample and should you correct for a bias sample uh, if you happen to get a bias sample for example if one demographic doesn't votes in far uh in five fewer numbers than another demographic <laughs> and of course uh, like many normative questions it's unlikely that there's a one size fits all answer but i think it's still important to engage in a little bit more in this uh, kind of thinking at least for our community right uh, and so on the theory such empirical side uh, if we assume the normative uh, uh, principle that is important for a civic process to have equitable participation then how do you choose such a set under two common real life situations for example when the participants are recruited via online advertising or when the participants are self selected okay. and this problem is complex uh, and i want to clarify this problem is worth studying even when the organizers of the process can choose a set of participants explicitly for example you can go and pick people uniformly at random uh, and you can even sort of pick people uniformly at random from a particular community right and so there's been some nice work on this in this direction by fanning and et al but i'm going to sort of uh, but but the case where uh, these participants are recruited either via online advertising or when the participants are self selected that's sort of uh, also a fairly hard question right. so for equitable participation i'm going to give you uh, uh, a bunch of examples and then i'll move on to deliberation <laughs> so uh, in uh, 2013 uh, uh, one of my students david lee uh, worked with the uh, tanya aitamurtho and uh, ellen landmore and they helped finland crowdsource uh, is off road traffic law okay and the off road traffic law in in uh, finland is mostly about where snowmobilers can go in the winter and mostly about whether snowmobilers can go wherever they want or should there be more restrictions on where they want to go okay. and uh, uh, there were like lots of things on the ballot so for example there were like hundreds of questions on the ballot and uh, we asked students to do a bunch of comparisons uh, we asked people to do uh, a bunch of uh, rating tasks okay? and then uh, once once they did that there was enough data here that we could then cluster the opinions of individuals into two clusters okay and we found this nice minority cluster and this is what i call uh, this kind of a cluster is what i would call an unsupervised minority or a non demographic minority right because these are not minorities by demographics these are minorities in terms of the opinions that they expressed okay? but as it turns out this uh, minority cluster uh, had very different opinions their opinions are here in blue and the majority cluster had opinions which are in red but then we sort of dug deeper into the demographics of these minority and majority clusters and the majority cluster was people who were uh, outdoor enthusiasts and uh, uh, snowmobilers and the minority cluster was uh, farmers who owned a bunch of this land that the snowmobilers wanted to go on and uh, environmentalists and women okay and there's no way there should be a minority cluster because in finland there there are as many men as uh, uh, as many women as men right the first order right but still in this particular setup there were uh, the all the women and all the environmentalists and all the landowners together were a minority and that's because the people who own these snowmobiles were highly motivated to go and participate in this process right now in this particular case uh, all we had to do was write a report so we write a report highlighting these two clusters and we send this to the finnish parliament but if we had to do this if we were actually doing uh, making policy directly on this basis should we have taken this minority cluster and blown it out uh, to its appropriate demographic size or uh, should we have just kept the results as is and i i must say i don't actually know the right answer i i'll, I'll give you one more illustration of uh, the same uh, idea right but in uh, in something which is sort of uh, more recent and more uh, topical <laughs> the we ran a survey in austin in 2020 using the same platform that i just showed you for long beach the interface was similar to long beach i am not going to show you the interface again and the following timeline happened from jan to april 2020 we designed and launched this survey uh, very much like the long beach survey 
and uh, as you can imagine this is when covid was happening so from jan to april uh, by the time we started and from the time we started and time we launched the amount of interest the city had in this uh, survey kept going up because all the in person uh, mechanisms for getting feedback on the budget essentially got cancelled on um, may 1 2020 the survey launched with modest response as these surveys often launch we had an average of 26 uh, uh, sort of votes or surveys a day till uh, May 28. And that's also not bad because that would have sort of averaged out to around a thousand uh, words, which seems fine for a survey of this type. On May 25, 2020, uh, there was a the murder of George Floyd. And on May 28, 2020, there were protests across the US. And there are a number of tweets about the budget survey, including the fact that police funding was on the survey, one of the questions on the survey. And the number of responses increased dramatically. From May 31, 2020 to June 9, 2020, there were an average of around uh, more than 3,300 3, responses a day. So it went up a hundredfold. Uh, on June 15, 2020, uh, we had a preliminary report that we shared with the city leadership uh, by Yiling Chen, Ludwig Gilaf, uh, and uh, myself. And it's on Ludwig's uh, webpage. Or if you send me an email, I'll uh, uh, point you to it. And then um, on July 13, the city manager's budget was presented to the city council with a 2.5% cut suggested in police funding, which is roughly the level that we had from the survey. Yeah. So, but but clearly the amount of interest in this uh, platform really spiked after May 28th, right? And uh, if you look at, for example, the responses, uh, what, the, what the first 200 people suggested or the last 200 people suggested, right? The first 200 were well before uh, George Floyd's murder and the last 200 were well after the protest, right? Yeah. The first 200, uh, let's just focus on uh, the police department. So if you look at the first 200, right, you'll see that uh, this bulb here says that shows that the amount of intensity for people who wanted to increase and decrease was about the same. Uh, if you look at what happens after, you see that uh, now the process becomes very bimodal. There's some, there's a, there's a set of people which have pretty much the same kind of distribution as before. Some want to increase, some want to decrease, and there's a set of people who really want to be want to decrease it to the maximum amount possible. Okay? The vertical bar here is the number of people who want to decrease something, and the horizontal is how much they want to increase or decrease it by. This X here is the minimum amount that was allowed permissible to be decreased on the ballot that we uh, we had. So clearly, uh, uh, one could hypothesize that uh, this survey uh, sort of uh, attracted a very different uh, demographic uh, or a very different set of uh, participants after the George Floyd protest than it did before the George Floyd protest, right? It could have happened with multi in multiple ways. It could have happened because uh, people's opinions changed. It could also have happened because uh, uh, people's opinions didn't change, but more people of a particular opinion then came and participated in the survey than uh, had before. Okay. And so at this point, um, it's generally not clear, uh, norm from a normative point of view, it's generally not clear whether uh, uh, the right thing to do here is to get a random sample of people from the city, or the right thing to do is to run this process and let the most motivated people come and actually cast their... Uh, uh, vote on the platform. And I'm, I'm sure people have an opinion about this. Uh, uh, so uh, Paul Girls points out that uh, this is one of the reasons uh, about highly motivated, this is one of the reasons why projects like those by Jim Fish can restrict participant to a, participation to a small random sample of the population. Uh, and that's true. But in this particular case, uh, that probably would have meant that uh, uh, the right outcome would have been, uh, it's possible that the outcome in this particular case would have been uh, uh, sort of much more like the first 200 responses. Uh, and uh, much of our uh, polity is uh, conditioned on sort of people being able to mobilize for a particular cause and make their feelings heard. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, we should take this as a note of caution uh, that while it's, it seems like is all is the right thing to do to do a random sample, and that's what I'm trying to uh, try and, that's what I'm going to try to shoot for uh, in the next thing I describe. Okay. 
Yeah. So I'm not offering this as a critique to what other people are doing. This is also what we are trying to do. We are trying to sort of develop tools to get a, a more equitable sample uh, among various demographics from the city. Um, I, I just want to point out this is like a normatively, uh, it's a fine normative assumption to make as long as you realize it's an assumption. And as long as you also keep examining, uh, the community also keeps separately examining this assumption uh, vigorously. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, it took me a few minutes to get my uh, screen shifted around. Um, By the way, Ashish, uh, you have about uh, you have about 15 minutes left and there are some questions in the chat, but I suggest that you go ahead and finish the talk and then we can use the last 10 minutes to, to answer questions. Okay. So I'm gonna skip uh, our work on equitable participation via online advertising. Uh, this is sort of our attempt, this was our attempt to use uh, targeted advertising to achieve uh, a representative cohort in uh, processes such as participatory budgeting. But I, 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 I feel like our work here is just sort of one in a chain of uh, results. Um, for example, uh, I'll just point out the people who have been, other people who have been working in this area. It's a chain of results, uh, including work by Celis et al, Chavla et al, and uh, um, uh, Sally et al. And, and once again, please feel free to reach out to me later. So I'm going to sort of stop. I'm going to not talk about this uh, work on advertising. I'm going to still move on, instead move on to work on. Uh, so I may ask what people are saying. Seeing Are people seeing my uh, something called uh, EC21 keynote? Are they seeing something different? Yes, we are seeing something that says EC21 keynote. Right. And so part three mechanisms and platforms for deliberation? Yes. Okay. So, so in this part, uh, we're going to talk about sort of move a little bit beyond voting and start to talk a little bit more about deliberation. So in voting, what happens is I just go and express my opinion, but I'm not interacting with anyone else's opinion. Okay? And so we'll, now we'll describe a sequential deliberation mechanism with provably good properties, which assumes that users indulge in negotiation with each other. Okay? I just want to point out that there's a difference between negotiation and true deliberation. For example, deliberation involves persuasion and involves this, uh, almost this uh, Habermasian ideal where, which says that deliberation is full of aim to achieve uh, the unforced force of the better argument. If two people are deliberating, it should not be the power structure between the two, but it should be who has the better arguments that prevails. And we'll try to dis we'll describe the design of a platform that tries to achieve true deliberation, which is heavily influenced by deliberative polling. Uh, an approach to inform civic deliberations pioneered by Jim Fishkin. And this platform has also been designed in conjunction with this group. But first the theory part, because I feel like I haven't done any, described any sort of formal models in this talk. So I, it'd be good to see some more formalism. So in sequential deliberation, I'm going to assume that all possible solutions to a decision-making problem are nodes in what are called a median graph. And this is a restriction, the fact that they have to be a median graph, but it's not too much of a restriction. Uh, a median graph is a graph where there's unique point on the pairwise shortest paths between any three nodes. And examples are lines, trees, hypercubes, high dimensional spaces with Dalman norm. So often in this field of computational social choice, you would see protocols analyzed on a line uh, where people's opinions lie on a line and a single peak. And this one is a bit more general. They could sort of essentially lie in any high dimensional space with L1 norm. <laughs> We can assume that each user is also a point in the same median graph uh, corresponding to the ideal solution of the user. Okay? And a user's unhappiness with the solution is uh, basically the distance between that user's ideal point V and the shortest path, uh, the length of the shortest path from V to S in G should have been S not W. Okay? I'm gonna further assume the median graph is not known to the mechanism designer. That is to say we are not allowed to do algorithmic aggregation. Okay? So here's our model. So we assume that N is a set of agents that's given to us. We start with an initial solution. We call it S0. The zero represents the time. So this is at time zero and S represents the solution. So for example, this could be the ideal point of a random agent. Then for rounds from T equal to one, two, and like all time, we choose two agents uniformly at random from all agents, UT and VT. We give, take the current solution, which is ST. Okay. And then agents UT and VT bargain with the current solution ST as the outside alternative. Yeah. If they agree, then ST plus one becomes the agreement point. And if they disagree, ST plus one remains 
ST, okay, whatever it was before. So we're not going to sort of assume, we're not going to study this process as some fixed time. We're going to instead analyze the expected distortion of the stationary distribution of S, right? Where the distortion is basically the solution that we came up with. How much how much more cost does it impose on uh, the population in overall compared to the optimum point? Okay. I'm going to assume that agents do Nash bargaining. And Nash bargaining, of course, is axiomatic justification uh, is equal to maximizing the product of the improvements of the two participants. For this audience, I'm not going to sort of dwell on what Nash bargaining is. Okay. And so here are the results. Uh, on median graphs, Nash bargaining between agents U and V with ideal points PU and PV using a disagreement outcome S actually finds the median, the exact one median of PU, PV, and PS. You can analytically compute the bounds and approximating the social cost minimizer by embedding onto the hypercube. Okay. Uh, all agents bargaining by truthfully representing the ideal point is a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of the extensive form game defined by sequential bargaining. Okay. And finally, uh, the thing that's the most interesting, no, sorry, the second most interesting is the chosen alternative converges to a station distribution in a constant number of steps. Okay. So it's, we very quickly go into a station distribution. And this is sort of joint work with uh, Brandon Fain, Kamesh Munagla, and Sakul Sakshawang. It's old work, but I'm going to point out uh, some recent results towards the end. So here's some intuition on the line. So imagine that uh, uh, these points lie on the line. Uh, the first claim that I made was that on median graphs, Nash bargain between agents U and V with ideal points PU and PV using disagreement outcome S finds the median of PU, PV, and PS. And so so here, once again, sort of assume that uh, P, PU is uh, one participant, PV is another point participant, S is the solution that's given to us. Okay. So first of all, observe that if, If S lies between P, U, and P, V, then there's no Pareto improvement over S as far as U and V are concerned, right? Um, if S is where to lie between P, U, and P, V, then if you move to the right, then U is unhappy. If you move to the left, then V is unhappy. And therefore, they'll never agree. So the Nash bargaining point will just be B equal to S if it lies between P, U, and P, V. And so the result of the Nash bargaining solution must always lie between P, U, and P, V, else there's a strict Pareto improvement. Yeah. And then uh, suppose S is less than PU less than PV and the bargaining point is B equal to X plus PU. Then you can uh, show that uh, we need to find the X that maximizes the product of the improvement and that turns out to be exactly PU. Okay. So basically in every case, uh, the, out, the outcome is going to be the median of uh, S, PU and PV. Okay. Then we can analytically compute uh, Bounce and approximate the social cost minimizer by embedding onto the hypercube. Okay. And so assume endpoints on the line. If the current solution is xi, the next solution will be xi if we choose one point from each side of xi, and at least xj, where j is bigger than i, if we choose both points to be at least as large as xj. Okay. And uh, at most xj, where J is less than I if we choose both points to be at most as large as XJ. Yeah. And this gives you some uh, simple uh, random walk on the line, which you can explicitly analyze and bound for all median graphs. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, the intuition about uh, convergence. Yeah. And instead, uh, uh, go to our bounds. So we can show for sequential deliberation, we can show that, uh, if, that if we keep doing the sequential deliberation for a while and we get a sample from the station distribution, we get a distortion of 1.208, where random rate ratio would have given us two. And 1.20 is actually not that bad because uh, A, we're only doing this deliberation and this negotiation in uh, very small uh, groups, okay? in groups of two, in fact, at a time. 
and uh, uh, nobody the, the mechanism designer doesn't actually know the median graph there's all the aggregation that's happening here is being done by these individuals is not really being done algorithmically and so 1.208 is actually not that bad there's a lower bound of 1.125 and interestingly, the expected expectation of the squared cost or the variance is also finite uh, for this method. Even simpler single round methods also have good performance. So uh, I mentioned that we have some new results and they have to do with sequential derivation of participatory budgeting. In participatory budgeting, the budget constraint forces a set of feasible solutions to lie on a simplex, which is not a median space. Yeah. But then, uh, uh, so, so in that sense, sequential deliberation is harder for participatory budgeting, but it's also good in some ways if voters understand project interactions and two interacting projects can be the perfect complements or perfect substitutes, then you can show the sequential deliberation with interacting projects reduces the sequential deliberation without project interactions. So if you could do sequential deliberation for PB and show good results, then those good results would immediately translate the PB with interacting projects. Okay. And so we recently showed that uh, a single round sequential deliberation has distortion less than two for participatory budgeting. There's still a large gap between the lower bound, which is 1.3x and the upper bound, which is 1.9x. Okay. So what, what directions does it lead to? In theory, uh, you could do a direct extension of our results. Okay. What, can we extend these results to beyond median spaces? Can we get stronger results for participatory budgeting? Can we analyze groups larger than three? Yeah. But there's also, in theory, you could also develop axiomatic approaches to group deliberations. What's a good, uh, when can we say we have done a we have engaged in a deliberative process that was actually good, right? Uh, what properties does it need to have? And that's the kind of thing where I feel this community could offer uh, immense value. Then on the modeling side, uh, it'll be very interesting to get realistic mathematical models of opinion change via deliberation. Things which can take into account is like empathy. My opinion changes because I start to see things from your point of view. <clears throat> Cognitive dissonance. My opinion changes because my expressed opinions and uh, my personal behavior were just too far apart. I could not really, could not sort of reconcile them. Uh, Habermasian argument. Someone just gave me an argument that was just too convincing. Uh, surprising validators. I heard something which was uh, which changed my opinion, and I believe it because I heard it from someone like me. And then, of course, deployments, uh, then implementation of these ideas in the context, for example, of deliberative polling by Fishkin et al. And then along these lines, uh, we have made uh, some start. Uh, we are developing a self-moderating platform for online deliberation. Uh, and this is uh, basically sort of tries to simulate deliberative polling where a randomly chosen group of participants first read briefing materials and written presentations by experts and participate in moderate a small group discussions and develop additional questions to ask at the end. And then they are polled at the end of the process. <clears throat> this uh, deliberative polling process, not our platform, the deliberative polling process has been immensely successful, used over 70 times. And our platform is a video conferencing platform for just a small group discussions for this part uh, of the process uh, without a human moderator. Yeah, so when you don't have a human moderator, then you can repeat the process uh, uh, many, many, many times. You can do many, much larger groups. Okay. And occur, incorporates things like queuing, uh, agenda management, nudges. I ran out of time to do a demo of the platform. In any case, a demo of a video conferencing platform over Zoom uh, is generally sort of not that convincing. So I would encourage you to go to our website, which is stanforddeliberate.org. It's been used extensively for deliberative polling during the last year, especially as you all know, it's been hard to do in-person uh, events over the last year. Yeah. And so uh, this led to the fact that there was uh, so much interest in using our platform for deliberative polling last year led to a natural experiment. Uh, our platform was used to conduct a deliberative poll in Japan on solar energy and an in-person DP on a very similar topic, in fact, two were conducted in Japan a few years ago. Yeah. And then on the same metrics, uh, that are used to evaluate uh, the in-person DP, the platform achieves parity with the in-person DPs. I'm sorry, I was going to do a demo which had, uh, and along with the demo, I had the names of everyone who participated. So on this slide, I don't have the names of everyone in the paper, um, but they are Sukul uh, uh, Saksakshiwang, uh, Ludwig Gilov, uh, Jim Fishkin, Alice Hugh, uh, 
myself, Kamesh Monagla. Uh, and then uh, the the, the research, the sort of important research direction here is to narrow the gap between the kind of protocols that we can analyze and processes like deliberative polling that have been shown to work in practice. And uh, just as a parting uh, slide, I'm going to leave uh, this slide on, which is uh, uh, in-person uh, deliberative polling versus our deliberation platform. When evaluated on six different questions, uh, the light blue at the top is uh, in-person in Japan in 2012. The one in the middle is in-person in Japan in 2014, and the bottom is our platform. So you can see on these six questions, which is how DP generally gets evaluated. Uh, our platform is sort of on uh, achieves uh, parity with uh, the other two. And sometimes it's slightly less, sometimes it's slightly more, but it's generally uh, either bet much better or within the error error bars compared to the in-person in process. There's some evidence that this uh, the video conferencing system that we have developed is actually coming close to achieving what uh, the in-person DP achieved. So at this point, I, I know I covered a lot of ground. I'm going to stop here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Ashish. That, that's, that was a really nice uh, talk and lots of ideas and uh, yeah, really, really thought provoking. Um, thank you so much. So we have time for questions. Uh, so if you have any uh, questions, please uh, raise raise your hand, um, and I will look through and scroll through the the gallery and and uh, find you. Uh, I'm going to start by reading out some of the questions I will post on the, on the chat and then you can address them, Ashish. So um, Haris Aziz asks, um, since this work on propor proportionally fair clustering, uh, for example, Chen et al in ICML, and it says by viewing people's spatial as data points with relevant attributes. And, and he says, I was wondering if these clustering methods can be used for finding proportional small samples. So I, I'm not uh, aware of this uh, work on proportionally fair clustering. <clears throat> but uh, assuming that I can sort of uh, guess at it, I think uh, if you're clustering based on attributes, <clears throat> then that's uh, what I would call demographic clustering. And that's distinct from what I would call uh, opinion clustering or uh, uh, unsupervised uh, or finding unsupervised minorities or opinion minorities. And the goal there was to sort of uh, cluster the opinions of individuals as expressed on the on the uh, voting platform on the deliberation platform. And then out there, find if there's a minority cluster and make sure that minority opinion also gets flagged to a decision maker. So it wasn't so much about uh, trying to find a sample of people. It was more like after the fact, making sure that the minorities uh, in uh, any particular process that, that the minority voice also got heard and the minorities being opinion minorities. It's possible I'm not understanding the question uh, well enough to answer it any better, but uh, Harris, please feel free to jump in if I'm not. Um, next next question is from Vince Kornitzer. Uh, he says, great talk. Uh, can you say anything about behavioral aspects and studies of those? Um, for example, I, I imagine that uh, how you present things can significantly affect how people respond. Um, so, we personally we have done uh, only a little bit in this direction <clears throat> so personally what we have done is are things like we have tried to randomize the order in which we present projects <clears throat> and uh, what we found that at least that the, the order in which you present projects doesn't you seem to have like a huge uh, doesn't seem to have any impact on which projects actually get funded um, there was also some work by uh, uh, people in uh, prokashia's group on uh, trying to do many, like five or six different voting methods for the same election. And they basically gave roughly the same results. So it, it didn't seem to matter that much about, uh, it didn't seem to matter that much uh, uh, exactly which uh, voting method you got used. And so, uh, but on the other hand, this is clear they're going to be behavioral aspects. Uh, it's just that they haven't manifested themselves in this in the simple, uh, participatory budgeting kind of processes that we've been running. Um, more questions? So 
So I, I'm, I'm curious about something myself. So you, you mentioned uh, when you're talking about part participatory uh, budgeting, um, this um, contradiction between the fact that the, the menu of options are chosen by, um, um, by, by, by the city or by rep representatives and then, and then people vote on the, on the items in the menu and you are thinking about also making the menus uh, be part of the, of the, of the choices. So I was curious if there's any progress on, on that and what, what ideas you're, uh, you, you have about, about that kind of problem. Um, so I think uh, um, so, so one possibility could be one thing that's promising and this is sort of joint work with uh, uh, a bunch of my ex students and uh, Kamesh uh, <coughs> Munagla <laughs> And uh, uh, one approach could be to assume that uh, everybody sort of gets uh, uh, a certain amount of influence and they can come and take the current budget and they can move it uh, by a certain amount. And if they move it by, and this amount that they can move it sort of goes down uh, as more and more people arrive. So the first person can move the budget by a lot. The second maybe by half as much, the third maybe by a third as much. And the hope would then be that uh, by allowing every successive person to sort of move the budget in whichever direction they want, uh, however they want, but by a small amount. Uh, if someone has an idea sort of a little bit later in the process, which is very convincing, then everyone after who comes after will be able to sort of align with that idea and that project will get done. Um, uh, and, so, and there's some theorems there that you can show uh, in that broad space, which are very much like showing their stochastic gradient descent converges to an optimum solution. <laughs> the other direction could be, for example, the, the kind of uh, the sequential method that I was describing. That method would be uh, completely fine with people introducing new projects. And you, you take a budget that somebody else gave you, and then there are two people in the room and they can sort of change the budget whichever they want. <laughs> and so that method has sort of much more flexibility built in. We have time for one more question. And this is a question from William Swicker in the chat. Um, he says, uh, deliberation can attempt to identify the right decision or can try to identify the consensus decision, which would not entail changing opinions. And wonder if you have any comments about that. Um, yes, I think this is sort of the what was described here. And I'm glad this question got asked because I think I didn't do as vigorous a job of pointing that out in my talk as I should have. <laughs> This, I think, is the current state of EC, of, of where our community is, uh, at least definitely where my work is, where I think the field of computation social choice is, where uh, this community is, and we have to somehow find, get to the, uh, figure out the right models which will take us to the next step. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, so right now, the, the sequential derivation method that I described was just horse trading. I'm negotiating with you, but I'm not changing my opinion. Yeah? That's not what happens when you do a real life deliberation. What you say actually changes my opinion, it changes my own objective function by which I'm optimizing. Uh, it makes you see things from your point of view. And so I think that's what uh, William uh, is referring to by the right decision. The decision that we would make if we really understood all sides of the issue, right? Versus just horse trading with each other and trying to come to some consensus by, by the process of give and take. Now this process of horse trading is basically negotiation and game theory has sort of a beautiful literature on bargaining that we can start to borrow, which makes it easier to analyze things of the latter type, uh, where you're trying to sort of, uh, in Williams, who are trying to identify the consensus decision without changing opinions. It does not really sort of lend itself to the previous type where we're trying to find the right decision by examining our own objective functions. I think that would be sort of a good challenge for, for all of us. Thank you so much, Ashish. Now we are out of time and the rest of the talks will continue. So um, th th thanks again for a great talk and uh, yeah, thanks everyone.